and Opus 1 is very special. It is a beginning, an exposure to the many possibilities that lay ahead. For Donald Harris, the sonata was the bridge to an inner, inexhaustible font of creativity, and so to his future successes as a professional composer. At age 22, I began learning the sonata, and this very work was my discovery of post-tonal music. Through it, I heard and felt the great innovations of modernism, and my analytical and emotional thinking have not been the same since. The first piece that I'm going to be playing for you is the Sonata 1957 by Donald Harris. Now, Harris was born in 1931. He's an American composer, but he wrote this piece when he was living in Paris in the mid-50s, and he spent quite a deal of time in Paris, actually, up through the end of the 1960s. And he came there to study with a very famous French pedagogue by the name of Nadia Boulanger. And so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it is the Sonata 1957 in four movements by Donald Harris. future is to be true to yourself. You don't have to follow the fads or the fashion. I never tried to be fashionable. I only wanted to write what was music to me, what was meaningful, emotionally meaningful. So I remember how we met. You do. I do, I do. Uh, it was actually a, a strange circumstance because I had played the piece before I met you. So I knew you through the music first. Back in 2000, Lucas Foss invited me to perform at the Festival of the Hamptons. And he called me up and said, uh, on the condition, as it were, mm -hmm. that you play a piece by a friend of mine, Don Harris. Lucas Foss asked me if I wanted to work with you prior to the performance. And uh, I refused. <laughs> I was 22 and I figured that it would be too nerve-wracking for me to meet with you and have you work out the uh, details of the sonata before the very first performance. Although now in retrospect, maybe I, I should have met with you. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I remember that uh, I stayed with friends on, on at, at Bridgehampton and went to the concert and, and heard the piece. That's where I heard the piece. Didn't even know what you looked like mm, until you true. came on stage. That's right. Then you, we went, I went on stage afterwards, then we, we met at a party. Afterwards. But the performance was okay. It was very good. Yeah, you liked it. Very, uh, good, very good. Which is probably why you're here today, if, I, well, I don't know. <laughs> if it hadn't gone uh, that no, well. No, I think it's because you've done so much with it. You've played it, oh, quite a bit. You, Pro yeah, I have. Uh, several performances, uh, as often you, as I can. And you also did a term paper on it? I, I actually did more than one. I, when I was in graduate school, I did several analyses of yeah. the, uh, the first and the third movement. The best compliment I can make to you is you're a freak in our society. That you pick up this sonata, even if it was suggested by Lucas Foss, we're all freaks. I don't feel that I fit into this world that, that we're in Neither now. Neither do I. Inspiration, to me, is tied into the question of communication, of how you're going to notate what you're doing. When I start with a sketch, it can be a sketch with an, an idea, a rhythm. It could be a pitches. It could be succession of pitches. It could be accents, durations, spaces. There's so many aspects to music that combine together to make a piece. You have a blank page, you got to fill it up. But filling it up is not just with notes. 
it's with a feeling, a sentiment, a, a sense of, of, of what you want to communicate. Well, there's that glue that holds all of these disparate elements together. So would you say that that maybe is getting closer to the heart of inspiration? That's what it is, inspiration. Coming up with the right glue? Making something out of nothing. I didn't decide to become a composer until um, I, was, I was in high school. What happened is that uh, there was a teacher in my high school who had went, gone to Columbia. He was a German teacher, but he also taught some music. And I went to him to learn harmony because all the rage then in the jazz world was Woody Herman writing for Igor Stravinsky, Igor Stravinsky writing for Woody Herman, Stan Kenton publishing scores, and I wanted to learn how to do this so I could keep on enjoying music. And before long, I, I'd studied the whole, the whole Foot and Spalding Harmony book, and I'd written a small string quartet, and I applied to the University of Michigan as a composition major for the freshman, my freshman year. I had a wonderful teacher, Ross Lee Finney, who had many, many wonderful students. And uh, he was terrific to me. I got exposed to a lot of music. He was a student of Nandi Boulanger and Al Bombert, believe it or not. I tell you, in my uh, freshman year at college, I wrote a piano piece, a little two-part invention built upon rising fourths, because Bartok was writing with rising fourths. Oh, yeah. I thought it was a masterpiece. <laughs> so uh, we had a little student recital and uh, Ross Finney said, now let's talk about the music of our freshmen. That wasn't music. That was just an exercise. Yeah. He just yeah. totally destroyed it. Yeah. And uh, he was a wonderful teacher, Ross Finney. I don't want to take anything away from him. But I was demolished by the whole thing. Do you think he might have been right? <laughs> he was exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> he was right on target. That's what I thought. <laughs> right on target. graduate school, I had a friend, uh, Ed Shudikoff, who had had a Fulbright to London, and in the British Museum, he copied by hand the Weber Symphony, Opus 21, because the scores weren't available, and he couldn't Xerox scores, there were no Xerox machines, and he couldn't take the scores out of the British Museum, because they were protected, so he copied it by hand, and I still have the score that he copied by hand. That's amazing which I then analyzed, and I did it color-coded so that it's got all the different, uh, the row structures clearly outlined. And it was this row structure that influenced the piano sonata. Yeah, you show this overlapping of the uh, different pitches, yeah. the different elements of the row. Which is what I did in the piano sonata. But it was something I knew, I mean, you know, when I started to experiment with cultural music. This is amazing. So this document is from your, your college days. I was a graduate student, and I, 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 uh, I got my master's, mm -hmm. and I started working on a DMA, mm -hmm. and I was so tired of college that I needed to take some time off, and my dream was to go work with Nadia Boulanger. you will expect to get too much too rapidly. Boulanger may line everything up for you in a beautiful routine. Don't let her dominate you. Make her concern herself with your work. How I envy you for going to Paris to study and to work. I am glad that you are not going to miss that experience, and I hope that you will love Paris the way I do. Have faith in yourself, Don, and a wonderful year, and a bon voyage. My very best, always, Ross Lee Finney. I had written a nutty wall and hadn't gotten a response back to see what take me on as a student. So I got to Paris in August.
Mademoiselle Boulanger was quite an experience. She showed me into her studio. It is very elegantly furnished with the best period furniture. There is a small grand piano, numerous photographs of musical friends, and right in the center there is the most beautiful small Baroque organ that I ever saw. By this time I could hardly see. She looked at my scores. She is very forward in her criticism and spares no punches. I have no idea what she thought of me, but I was very impressed with her. I know that certainly I shall never meet a better musician in my life. But she is dogmatic. When she tells you something, she makes it known that this is the gospel, and there is nothing else to say. I was living on the Rue La Boissy in the apartment of a hatmaker, a woman's hatmaker, on a charge, second floor. So it was a fashionable floor to have a shop. Her name was, was Gusta Rotner. We would take occasional trips to visit monuments, churches, and, and different places of interest that might not, otherwise not have known about. Mm -hmm. We would explore Paris together. Right. She introduced me to, and, and to literature. I read a lot of Flaubert and Zola, Balzac. Gusta taught me how to live in France, and I was very fond of her, very fond. But I wrote it, wrote it very quickly, the piano sonata. A matter of months, again, three and, months. And I dedicated it to Gustav Rotner, who was very supportive of my work, very helpful to me. Mm -hmm. I felt supported in what I was doing, even though I wasn't happy with Boulanger. I mean, we all know about Boulanger. She certainly wasn't an enthusiast about 12-tone music. Or, no, no. And uh, here you are writing basically 12-tone. Exactly. And uh, so, did this ever come up when you st were studying with her? I once brought her uh, this published score of the Stravinsky Septet, which didn't have a 12-tone or a 7 or 8 yeah. or 9 tone or something like seven. that. 7, pentatonic. Seven, that's what it was, anyway. Yeah. I had bought the score at Boozy and Hawks and I showed it to her. I was so excited that he was, you know, doing this. And she dismissed it as saying, oh, it's an old man playing with his jewels. I was becoming more and more interested in Schoenberg and Tolton music. She wasn't. And uh, so I, uh, I needed to get away from that atmosphere and, and compose again. I was always a little bit apprehensive about studying with her because the last year I was at Tanglewood as a student, just before I left for Paris, I was talking to Roger Sessions, who was teaching there that summer, and I said I was going off to study with Nadia Boulanger. He said, don't let her ruin you, were his words to me. So I knew that there was a different side of the whole thing. But on the other hand, when uh, my music was first published, Jobert sent her a score that they published with my, my fantasy for violin, which is a pretty strict 12 tone. Yeah. And she wrote me a lovely letter, yeah. which I kept, yeah. where she was very happy about the, of receiving the music. And, uh, and she said, there's music in this. It was a, he had la musique, she said. Yeah. You talk about, in, your, in some of your reminiscences of her, that she had devised little tricks and musical exercises to oh, test your she, musicianship. She would, she would. She would have me play a uh, Bach chorale standing up but playing three of the voices and singing the voice I wasn't playing. That was very hard, because I was standing up. I actually recall doing the same in my own musicianship yeah, courses. I can't sing anyway, so that was <laughs> part of the problem. Right. And she had me play piano four hands with her, and I couldn't keep up with her. She had a score of the Bartok Miraculous Mandarin in front of her in a four-hand version. And, uh, she said, Harris, try with one hand. I, How did you keep up? I didn't keep up. I found that I wasn't composing. And uh, around sometime in the winter, I wasn't feeling well. And I went to the American Hospital, and I had jaundice, and I was put in I was put in bed for a few for a few weeks there. And I wrote her a letter and said, uh, "I'm going to st stop studying for a while. I'm going to take a little trip and collect my thoughts. I don't feel like studying anymore." So you had been with her for just a matter of months. Yeah, a matter of months, a months.
returned home from the hospital where I had jaundice, and I left Nadi Boulanger. I took a trip to visit museums and churches and got to know Europe a little bit and came back to where I was living on the Rue La Boise. And it was towards October, I guess, when I started composing again. And I wrote the third movement, or started the third movement, when I realized there was a 12-tone row in it. So, that's it. And so I made that chart, which you saw. You still have the chart somewhere? Oh, absolutely. Anyway, so I wrote the third movement and realized that I had written a, a 12-tone piece, however embryonic 12-tone it was. Mm -hmm. So the whole piece came out that way. Then I wrote the fourth movement, as you know. Well, the fourth movement, I, I, I like the chorale with which it begins. piece of music I wrote without ever having shown it to the teacher. Start to finish, this was mine. It's a wonderful feeling to feel confident that you, in yourself, that yeah. you can do what's, what is meaning, meaningful to yourself. Because every note was meaningful to me. I loved every note. I caressed liber every Liberating. Liberating. And I didn't have to worry about whether a teacher liked it or disliked it. I just wrote it. But that's why it is so amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I still think it's absolutely amazing. When you finish composing a work, is it in fact complete when you hear it in your own head, the sort of internal performance, or do you require it to be performed by someone else? It needs to be performed, but uh, in the case of this piano sonata, believe it or not, when I wrote it, I could play it. I couldn't play it now. I don't have those kinds of chops any longer. I needed to have it performed and took I didn't know anybody in Paris in those days. I had left Nadie Boulanger and I was in between teachers. I knew I wanted to continue studying, but I didn't know any pianists. Performance took place thanks to Henri Dutilleux, a marvelous, marvelous, well-known French composer whose wife, Geneviève Joie, is a fantastic pianist. And she played the first performance. Listening to it now again, it touches me like Schubert. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. No, but it, it really does. <laughs> and I said that be before you came. I must tell you that, you know, I was very worried about this piece. I didn't think it was any good when I finished it. Yeah. Uh, composers are like that, you know. Schoenberg said he liked all of his music because he liked it when he composed it. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah. I, I put it in a drawer. But the thing is that there is something so right about it. Well, now, 50 years later, I feel that way, but 50 years later, it's more than 50 years. But I don't know, but is this for me was clear, and so yeah, I practiced, yeah, yeah. and I loved it. I love it. And I mean, I, I was just kind of, I, I was just thinking, I felt it. I felt it because it was right. It was true. I thought I was writing a three-movement sonata, and it surprised me when it turned out to be a four-movement sonata. But I was writing a sonata, and sonatas were not being written by a lot of people in those days. At that time, exactly. And that's was that's the, it's so it's uh, it's a young man's piece, but it does have this relationship to the past. I was never trying to break with the past, never have, and I never will. 
As a matter of fact, I, I, I saw this, this piece as part of a continuum, and I was integrating this language into, into past concepts. The first movement, really kind of in sonata-like reform. And there are the theme and variations, which is called theme and variation. Right, the fourth movement. Fourth movement, uh -huh. so I mean... Uh, Third movement, scherzo. Scherzo. Second movement, kind of a traditional slow movement. That's yeah. right, that's right. It was a traditional sonata. In the environment of Paris, at that time, in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s, with Boulez and Stockhausen and uh, Nono and all the mu music that was being written, there was a, a sense that we had to break with the past. The composers had to break with the past. I wasn't willing to do that. I showed it to Pierre Boulez the first time I met him in his apartment in the Rue de Beautreillis in Paris. Because I had heard the premiere of the Marcel saint so I decided I wanted to meet this man. I just looked in the phone book, found his name, and called him. And, uh, and he answered the phone. He said, come on over. And I went over and I showed him my piano sonata. And he said, it recalls the past too much. I appreciated his thoughts. I didn't buy into it uh, because I was interested in, I wasn't interested in, in destroying tonality. I, I felt my music was tonal. I felt the sonata was a tonal piece. I felt it was an E. That didn't mean anything to him. But I was interested by Boulez. Well, this was the Boulez of the uh, 50s and late 40s who right. we was all the said, militant Boulez. We uh, all, well, we all said a lot of things. I mean, uh, I passed up the opportunity to meet Stravinsky because I thought he was too old-fashioned. But anyway, getting back to, uh, that was stupid, very dumb on my part. I regret it to this day. All of these instances of major, minor, triads, uh, thirds, and sixths, like this, are very evocative of the past, and that's exactly what Harris had wanted to do. And maybe these complexes that we were talking about earlier, back to the 7-8 and the 9-8 measures, when you're hearing this, stacked triads, and then this massive eight-note chord, they sound very dissonant, but they're made up of traditional triadic and seventh chord elements. And the piece becomes essentially centered on E, at least in that local sense. And that's all accomplished by his manipulation of inversional and retrograde forms off of the prime form, which is originally stated at the beginning of movement three. This is the row he uses for the third movement. This is his original melody. Even if you know nothing about this kind of music, you can respond to, to gestures like this. You know, very fragmented, and as a result, maybe, as Richard said, very exciting. Uh, they almost throw you off a little bit because of the volume, uh, the dynamics, and also the, the rhythmic uncertainties and ambiguities, the metrical ambiguities, and those are all interesting things if you're open to it. If you're coming at it where you only can respond to music that does this, no, then obviously this is disturbing, to say the least, right? So it, it has to do with, as what Ian had said, you have to discover the language. And once you do, it's, it's a process of just broadening your perspective. And this and all kinds of music can be appreciated. And, even more than appreciated, they can ultimately be loved. There's a lot in this, in this sonata which was very important for my future development, and, and, and the idea of register and timbre and color was very important. It, it, you had to bring out all the colors in this sonata. Well, that's, that's what I was about to say, because what you were experiencing in the moment of composition is not what I see as a performer and an analyst looking at the music 50-odd years later. I see something very different. I see a complete finished structure that I can now parse mm -hmm. and try to dig into it to understand how it is that you came up with your structures. I was thinking color, the color, and the different colors you get from the different dynamics. The, uh, the rhythmic subtleties. Subtle rhythm. I, I remember that probably threw me most of all at the beginning of my process of learning this. In fact, even to this day, 10 years later, 
uh, I still have to make sure that the rhythm well, is absolutely precise. Well, something you can precise. do for piano, you can't do for other instruments. I mean, it's, it's got such mixed meter in the first movement. Mm -hmm. Tens and thirteens and... Elevens, you know, absolutely. Elevens, I mean, and uh, with just one soloist, it's possible. Orchestra, impossible. Look, what's the music, I mean, it's, even this is so clear. ba di da da di da di da di Oh, so you don't mix the meters so much no. in subsequent pieces? No, 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 this was, this was it. This was, this was my experiment with mixed meter, with, at least with a very complicated mixed meter. Well, uh, and I wasn't thinking so much that I wanted to do something different or experimental. I just wanted to, exp to have a, a vehicle for getting out the rhythmic impulses I felt in writing the piece. I didn't know a lot about 12-tone music at the time. Now this was in the 1950s. There wasn't a lot of books written about it. Rene Labowitz had a book, Schoenberg and his School, I think it was called. And that was about the best we could do, except for Schoenberg himself, who had published Style and Idea in 1951, and I had that original book. But there wasn't, like today, I mean, there's volumes and volumes and volumes about 12-tone music and, and articles and journals, and uh, it's become a, a, an, in, an industry in itself, uh, writing about it. And I wasn't into that. I, I, I was interested in developing my harmonic sense, my, my, my chromatic harmonic sense, because it's a very chromatic piece. And the harmonies, especially in the theme and variations, you get these series of chords. And they're not 12-tone chords, but combined together, they make, uh, I guess, a 12-tone row, if you want. I was interested in the kind of harmonies I could develop, the language I could develop as I, as I move forward. And that's always been guiding my music. Deutsch always said that music is harmony or it's not. And, and my music is definitely harmonic. Well, I feel that it's, it's much more contrapuntal in some areas than it is necessarily harmonic. You have to know harmony to write counterpoint. That's true. You know, I've heard a hell of a lot of bad 12-tone music. Oh, what? oh, yeah. Yeah. We all and have. Also a lot of great 12-tone music. Yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't be asking these questions if I didn't think this was awfully good. <laughs> yeah, I and know. And that you, I mean. at this early stage, composed something that is so consistent in its, in its language and, and the beauty of it and, 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 of course, form and structure and all of that. I'm still trying to figure out how you got there. <laughs> well, I, I wish I could tell you. I wish I could be more explicit. Twelve-tone writing in the piece uh, extends, obviously, to the pitch level, which is how you organize the row. But there's also the element of dynamics and register. I almost feel like I'm handling something extraordinarily fragile. Register was very important to me in this sonata. And even though I did use some six that were closely close together, there are all kinds of registral parts that, that show extremes or use of extreme use of colors, like in the second movement mm -hmm. and in the waltz of the theme and variations. There's a lot of misplaced beats and rhythmic syncopation and studying contrasts of sonorities, loud could, and soft. Could you envision people actually waltzing to this? <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe. Yeah, waltzing and stumbling at the same waltzing time. And yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been working on the sonata for a long time. Ten years. Ten years. Every time I look at this piece, 
I see something brand new. And, and that's why it's so intriguing to me. I'm not focused as much as I was in the beginning on the technical challenges of the fast movements. But to this day, what every time I have to play this, I think about how difficult it is to play the dynamics of, of the piece. And it's especially apparent in the second movement, where the loudest dynamic level is a mezzo forte, which in and of itself isn't even that loud. That's right. And the lowest dynamic is at the very, very end, where you have four pianos. So P, N, C, C, C. Play me a 2P. 3P. 4P. There you go. Wow. I'll be here all week. <laughs> <laughs> When I was composing this movement, this is a long time ago, it's over 50 years ago, but I do recall struggling with that ending, and I played around with a lot of different registers for that B, because it's, it seemed to fit. I don't know, maybe there isn't a reason that you can find it and analyzing it, but it seemed right that it had to be up in that high register. Well, you can listen on several levels. There's several levels to hear a piece of music, and I think Understanding the emotional level is, in, is another level of understanding which is important. Understanding the technical level is not as important. I mean, you don't want to listen to say, hey man, dig that retrograde inversion. Just because you know the, that the row is going from here to here doesn't make the music sound any better. It doesn't make you appreciate it more. And, and I'm sure as we analyze music, we need to know these things. But to the listener, it's the emotional kind. I'm concerned about the language of music, which has evolved so wonderfully. Uh, if you look at uh, the language of Messiaen, of Schoenberg, of Berg, of Baker, of Boulez, of uh, Elliot Carter, of all these wonderful composers, that the public still has not gotten used to. They're better off in Europe, I think. In Europe, they're more sophisticated, more sophisticated than we are. But uh, here we need to as an audience, as a public, we need to have people get used to the language. And if they're familiar with the language, they'll relate to the music and its emotional content. And they won't have to worry about the technical content. Schoenberg once said to his brother-in-law, Rudy Kolisch, so now you've counted the row, you know where it is. That won't help you to play the music. Well, I, I want to say this, though. It sounds to me that what you're saying is that gradually with more and more exposure, an audience's exposure to this kind of music, that what initially might seem very technical will translate into the emotional. Yeah. So perhaps there isn't, maybe these are not such discrete entities after all, the technical on the one side and the emotional on the other. Maybe it's just a question of where we are on that spectrum of understanding. The more you understand yeah, technically, there, there the more you get to the emotional. There was a French poet who greatly influenced me. It was Paul Valéry, and he wrote in one of his essays that he didn't want to see how a piece was feasted, how a piece was put together. He didn't want to know that. He just wanted to, wanted to relate to the piece itself. I'm trying to express sentiments in music which are hard to put into words. With hindsight now, I think this piece set the parameters for all of the music that was yet to come. It's interest in register, it's interest in sonorities, it's interest in harmony, it's interest in rhythm. All the parameters. Uh, All the parameters of my subsequent pieces. But you don't name pitch. No, I don't. Well, pitch was equal, equal interest. He was, but pitch always had status. But pitch was the status symbol for everything before that. Well, pitch is the traditional uh, yeah, element yeah, of all yeah, of yeah. this music. But this was a very, very happy time in my life. And I was composing again with a joie de vivre and enjoying it, enjoying what I was doing. So it, it got me going, loving Paris, loving the world I was living in. And a lot of that comes through in this piece. I think That's it's a, why I call it a French piece. I think it's a perfect example of a young person in a great city. Just yeah. 
just really a, a youthful piece. That's what it I mean. is a youthful piece. Very, very, very youthful. I wonder if you feel any nostalgia when you hear it. Well, I do. I don't hear it very much. I don't hear my music all the time. I, I, I'm always moving on to the next piece. So I don't listen to what I've done before. But thanks to you, I'm listening to this piece again. So have we, have we created something new as a result? In all of this revisiting and discussion and examining of the work? And, and also your time th in Paris think, at that time? I don't think it's new, but it has a life of its own now. Mm -hmm. It's got its own life. And I couldn't do it again. I couldn't write it again because it's what it was then. But it has its own life. In that sense, it's new.
is there such a distinction between atonal and tonal? It all depends on your perspective of what is resolved and what is unresolved. Yeah. You see, for me, for example, I, I can't explain how this happened to me, but I never understood the word dissonance. For me, there was no such thing. Nor did I. Nor did I. Nothing. It was all consonants.